There is, across the entire galaxy, nothing quite like the Sirius Initiative. It is a pioneer in galactic exploration, continually pushing the boundaries of what is known about the galaxy. Star system after star system has been charted by the Initiative, and their operatives have uncovered fascinating phenomena in their grand expeditions across previously untouched worlds. The Sirius Initiative has also provided great leaps in research, particularly revolutionizing the field of hyperspace mapping. The Turner-Young effect, that nearly doubled the effectiveness of hyperdrives, was discovered just 10 years after the Initiative's founding, and was just the first in a long list of discoveries. Without the Sirius Initiative, scientific progress in the last half-century would have been a lot slower. It has done all this, while technically being the single most potent paramilitary, based in United Nations territory. The Sirius Initiative sets itself apart from most successful exploration efforts, by being a non-governmental organization. A few private enterprises have managed to succeed in some measure or another, for a while, but generally, the immense upfront costs, high operating costs, significant legal complications, and extremely low chance of a successful return on investment mean that very few ventures into the field of interstellar exploration have survived. This was true, even when humans had not yet ventured past their moon. And it was proven painfully true yet again, in the post-Second Hacation War boom of humanity's space presence. As a result, by the time the Sirius Initiative began, the majority of exploration and surveying efforts conducted in or by citizens of the United Nations were done by its official Pioneer Corps. The sad reality, however, was that the Pioneer Corps languished. The United Nations focused much of its funding efforts upon building up and reorganizing its military forces, as well as expanding the amount of worlds and stations upon which it had control. Leaving a scientific body, whose eyes were mostly turned outwards, to suffer in budget after budget. The Pioneer Corps struggled to afford new equipment and was forced to develop techniques and technology with only what it could scrape together leading it to struggle even putting together operations in Geneva-packed space, let alone beyond it. Only in United Nations territory proper did the Pioneer Corps see most of its success, and this was hardly a great achievement. Rather like if Magellan had barely passed the Azores. While the budgetary decisions that caused this were extremely understandable, given the context of humanity's ascension to the stars, it was still a rather shameful affair for such a high-minded program to fall. This is the context in which the Sirius Initiative was birthed. Scientists from across the United Nations joined together in demanding a serious alternative, ultimately choosing to declare its formation on July 20, 2069. A symbolic link to where the Initiative's headquarters would eventually be located, Tranquility Base. The name, chosen by an overwhelming majority of member votes, was intended to honor a star that had been one of the first recorded by humans. At first, the Sirius Initiative would be funded significantly via private contributions, mostly donations from wealthy patrons, but would pick up steam as it received contracts from the United Nations as well as other Geneva Pact nations, and in rare cases, private corporations. These contracts, for tasks such as resource surveying, to long-range expeditions, to various grants for research work, would balloon in quantity, after the Turner-Young discovery proved the viability of the Sirius Initiative, ultimately becoming the primary source of funding. While some additional funding comes from nations within the UN as a whole, such as the Selene Republic, and its funding all initiative sites upon Earth's moon, the rest is made up of a mix of private donations, agreements with universities, and a not insignificant trickle from licensing rights. At least one Leonov class exploration vessel has been funded purely by the money gleaned from this avenue. Meanwhile, their official counterparts in the Pioneer Corps are limited mostly to highly technical survey work, determining precisely where to put a habitat or mining outpost on a world already surveyed, leading to its name being near utterly ironic. Its sole remaining domain in pioneering is that of pre-first contact research, an extremely narrow field, 
stretching from the short period between the detection of a live pre-FTL species to the initiation of contact procedures by the diplomatic wings of the United Nations. Effectively little more than preparing a dossier based on however much can be gleaned without exposing themselves to the species. It is a somewhat ignoble end for an institution created under such high aims, and yet, it is its duty. The sheer degree to which the serious initiative receives government contracts has led to it repeatedly drawing accusations of being simply an unstated arm of the United Nations. Indeed, its goals do generally align with the United Nations, and it is indisputable that the Geneva Pact has benefited more from the discoveries than the League of Balerf or other nations that are on similarly unfriendly terms. However, the Sirius Initiative rejects these accusations, noting that it has always strongly criticized the United Nations, such as their belief that the UN has failed by not abolishing the last remains of national sovereignty or their arguments that the UN military have become too expeditionary, failing their original remit as a defensive formation. Curiously, given this latter complaint, the initiative is mostly silent on the issue of United Nations deployments against the Torishamos, only bringing them up to specifically deny it feeds live targeting data to the United Nations, something no one has specifically accused the initiative of. Regardless, the Sirius Initiative does call upon the UN Stellar Navy for support during emergencies. Yet this is hardly something to crucify them over. Its strongest links to any specific UN institution is, surprisingly, with the United Nations Postal Service, whom it has provided the latest generation in laser defense technology for its flotilla of Mercury-class ships. UN Postal Service vessels often carry initiative members for short durations, as part of this deal, serving as a taxi service. And the Postal Service is known to have somehow coughed up funding for several serious initiative projects, as well as loaning them vital communications equipment. Beyond this relationship, however, the initiative mostly does its own thing, and certainly does not take direct orders from the United Nations. Most contracts are vague in their requirements and do not involve what could realistically be termed intelligence gathering operations, as this is something the UN already has its own forces for. Nor, as is sometimes claimed, does the United Nations have provisions to integrate the initiative directly into its ranks in wartime. Alignment of serious initiative goals with those of the United Nations are mostly coincidences, or otherwise, the result of being comprised so heavily of its citizens. As to the accusation of failing to share the benefits, unfortunately, the Sirius Initiative blames those other nations. All scientific data from the initiative is open access, meaning that the discoveries it makes are rapidly spread to the public, even across the line into non-Geneva Pact nations. However, the initiative mostly conducts its operations in or around Geneva Pact territory, due in no small part to the heavy difficulties it encounters when operating in League space. The League has never actively blocked the Sirius Initiative, but regularly holds up its expeditions and repeatedly demands the right to inspect its vessels for evidence of intelligence gathering operations, leading to the Sirius Initiative generally preferring to take its efforts elsewhere. There are two eye-catching portions to the Sirius Initiative, Expeditionary Division and Research Division. Expeditionary Division represents the outwards-facing work of the initiative, sending its expeditionary teams on long-duration missions to explore the galaxy. Constantly at work, the Expeditionary Division takes up the mantle of going where none have trod before, but is just as content to walk a beaten path if it believes it may yield new results. Expeditionary Division maintains its own fleet, an eclectic mix of custom-built craft and refitted donations of varying sizes and capabilities. Even these refits are capable in their own right, but the custom-built craft, chief among them the Leonov class, are the undisputed stars. Expeditionary division could arguably be termed the sensors, the eyes and ears of the Sirius initiative. But expeditionary teams can and will conduct analysis while in the field. 
Research Division works in tandem with Expeditionary, often providing potential avenues for exploration to Expeditionary, in return for fresh samples and fascinating data. It is far less noticeably structured, with personnel working from initiative-owned facilities, the laboratories of affiliated universities, or even from home, for a not insignificant portion. If Expeditionary could be inaccurately dubbed the sensors, then research is the processor, taking what it is given, and fully analyzing. This is less inaccurate than the moniker for Expeditionary, as it is rare that research will conduct field operations of its own, but it is occasionally sent personnel to join expeditions. The final division is the logistical division, tasked with keeping the expeditionary division supplied on its long campaigns of scientific inquiry. This is a relatively thankless task in the public eye, yet is no less important. For, without the willingness of the people of the logistical division to journey into the black for months on end, expeditions would stall and die very soon. The logistical division also tasks itself with keeping the facilities of the research division supplied and operates its own network of anchorages in order to provide safe harbors to the expeditionary division when far from home. Finally, the logistical division is tasked with attempting to balance the books for such an organization, usually doing so by seeking to keep things as in-house as possible or procuring equipment at the lowest possible cost without compromising on effectiveness. It is logistical who seeks out contracts that could feasibly be completed, who forges links with universities flush with cash, who licenses all the little things that bring in a bit more cash. It is the power supply, the coolant systems, the everything else of the massive computer of the serious initiative. At the lower levels, the serious initiative is a decentralized organization. Each member of its expeditionary teams is expected to approach polymath status, being fluent in starship maintenance, zero-g operations, and flying a dropship in an emergency, to name just a few desired traits. The initiative maintains a wide training pool however, accepting nearly any applicants, with only a few explicitly disqualifying factors. Initiative training focuses on building most recruits up to the required status, no matter how difficult. Sending applicants through the same cycle of training again and again, until they complete it. Washing out is reserved only for those who persistently fail with little sign of improvement or are otherwise assessed to be a danger to potential comrades. This latter reason is an extremely rare cause for disqualification however, with a serious initiative explicitly welcoming reformed criminals into its ranks. Most failures to complete training are simply the result of an individual choosing to drop out, with successful recruits generally being highly motivated. Once induction is completed, a recruit to the expeditionary teams will specialize, selecting a field that will be their primary focus. Doing so ensures that, in whatever situation an expeditionary team finds itself, it will always have someone with the best knowledge for the job, backed up by many more with good knowledge. From here, recruits will be selected for a specific expeditionary team, generally one on rest, so as to ensure their compatibility amongst their new comrades with it not being uncommon for a fresh member to be moved through at least one or two teams, before finally settling upon a more permanent one. When deployed, these teams are well-oiled machines, able to quickly adapt and collectively respond to whichever situation they find themselves amidst. Outside observers have described the decision-making process of an expeditionary team as loosely resembling democratic centralism, where a course of action will be democratically voted on by all members, before being unwaveringly adopted, though with options to reverse course if necessary. Expeditionary teams generally are not expected to answer to orders from higher up, once deployed, receiving only a list of potential destinations and requested investigations that the teams are free to disregard, as necessary. The only explicit exception to this rule is for operations helping other teams or for long-range search and rescue missions. However, it is an unspoken rule that no request for help from someone in need will ever be rejected by an expeditionary team. The research division, meanwhile, has very little resembling an induction process. 
instead, merely focusing on ensuring its candidates understand the professional standards they must hold themselves to, and encouraging them to find the scientific fields that best suit them. Its decentralization is more visible in day-to-day -day operations, as research groups form and dissolve at what seems like a dizzying pace, responding to the latest morsels of data, swelling and shrinking, as interest in a particular discovery changes. Logistical division often sweeps up individuals that were unable to complete the process of joining expeditionary, yet still wish to contribute to the broader exploratory goals of the initiative. It has perhaps the most rigid structure of the divisions, sending personnel and equipment to precisely where they are needed, doing precisely what the division believes the personnel and equipment to be most useful for. Additional flows of personnel are provided by retirements from expeditionary, who are often some of logistical's most valuable personnel. Each division is nominally commanded by a member of the triumvirate, who acts as a head of organization. The Triumvirate reports to a central committee, the key governing body of the Sirius Initiative, who in turn takes input from, and is nominated by the Initiative Assembly, a large body made up of ship captains, station commanders, and research team leaders. The Assembly will debate proposals regarding the key issues facing the strict quotas. And affirmative action policies are in effect to ensure that the assembly fairly represents the demographic makeup of the initiative, despite the focus on democracy and representation of members. It is generally agreed by outside observers that the initiative is effectively controlled by the logistical division due to its control over the coffers, as well as its plurality in the assembly. In terms of combat capabilities, it is hard to pin the Sirius initiative down. Indisputably, their vessels are highly capable in battle, sporting top-of-the-line shields, next-generation laser defense arrays, and even complements of missiles loaded with Kasaba Hoats or nuclear warheads. However, these systems, both in doctrinal intention and actual usage, are purely defensive. Whenever initiative vessels are attacked, they will focus on one thing, and one thing only surviving for as long as necessary to get help or escape. Their lasers melt enemy missiles at distance, easily able to survive concerted attacks by two or more equal tonnage vessels. A modern laser-equipped vessel fending off an attack by a missile swarm is an awe-inspiring thing, and a Leonov class doing the same is no exception. Shields take up the rest, with the Kasaba Hoitzer missiles utilized purely for a unique tactic pioneered by the Sirius Initiative. Using the intensely destructive beam of the warhead as a way to smack down missiles launched from well outside laser range, often perfectly calculating them for trajectories that can annihilate two missiles in a single blast. This tactic has since been adopted by the United Nations Stellar Navy. Again, raising questions as to just how much the initiative shares its notes with explicitly military organizations. Furthermore, the Sirius Initiative enjoys a certain degree of preferential treatment when it comes to certain systems and technologies fielded by the United Nations. For example, the initiative fields the Nimrod and FRAM suits for planetary and zero-G excursions respectively. It is consistently rumored that these are provided almost free of charge by their manufacturers in order to serve as a test bed for features that will later be deployed in United Nations armor sets, such as UZIA and H. Warang. Additionally, the Terra Nova Ultra Heavy Extended Duration Excursion suits, resembling the pre-contact mechs of science fiction and designed to do much of the work of an away team in a single package, bear a striking similarity to the rarely seen Ajax Ultra Heavy Battle Armor. These rumors obviously cannot be confirmed, especially as logistical division does not share numbers on how much the initiative spends to acquire its equipment. But it is hard not to notice that the expeditionary teams never quite seem to run out of suits for excursions. This is not the only example of equipment making its debut with the initiative. The Sirius Initiative fields a regularly upgrading armada of US-15 dropships for its expeditionary teams, and these will regularly trickle back improvements into the wider galaxy. Regardless, the fact remains that the initiative has never gone on the offensive. It does not even have a concept of an offensive. 
Training for ship commanders in combat focuses solely on disengagement and de-escalation, where possible. While the latter is rarely successful, the former almost always is, with initiative ships successfully escaping attack after attack. If necessary, an initiative ship will directly target its attacker, but focus its efforts purely on disabling the weaponry. Even when conducting exploration of Torishamo's occupied territory, indisputably the most heavily defended area of space, other than the capital systems of major powers, the Sirius Initiative has been able to do so with minimal casualties. An extremely impressive feat, particularly when combined with the high-quality data gathered by its teams. The most impressive aspects of their ships to the majority of analysts is, not their defensive systems, but their other features. Their life support systems, for sustaining missions of indeterminate length. Their sample retrieval and storage systems, arguably the most sophisticated, anywhere in the galaxy. Their engines and hyperdrives, optimized for speed and pinpoint accuracy. Their sensors, designed for rapid and accurate surveying of star systems, backed up by computer systems, and analytical programs of immense power. These are, truly, exploration vessels of a breed that could never have been imagined prior to the Sirius Initiative, let alone, before humanity became an interstellar species. It is said that, one day, perhaps soon, the United Nations will begin looking at visiting other galaxies. Not that it has run out of places to explore in this one, no, but purely a desire to go further, look deeper than ever before. If, or rather, when that day comes, it is certain that one organization will be leading that charge into the great unknown. The Serious Initiative. The author's name and the link to original text is in the description. Consider tapping the thumbs up and pressing the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video.